I was IFR, coming from the east. And as far as I could tell, I was the only traffic. Approach cleared me for the visual. Tower cleared me to land on runway four. He didn't say how. Uh, with the back wheels first? The fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Main gear first, nose gear second. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your hosts, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, clear visual approach from way 23 left, connect hour. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 and miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, let our contact climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received, squawk via fire, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach, Skyhawk runway 23 left. To enter triad class Charlie surface area from the east, maintain special Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Tron Alpha, this is triad approach, on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed, say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, May 9th, 2022, episode 227. On today's show, we'll talk about life before GPS, stray visual approach paths, and forced IFR cancellation. What's up, AG? Hello, hello, everyone. We're actually recording early. It's Friday. Happy Friday. Yes, Friday. Where are you going next week? I am going to, I'm going to play ARMY. Mm. For a couple of weeks. Weeks. <laughs> yes. My annual two week event. Mm, perhaps your last. Perhaps. Most likely, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps most likely. Hopefully. There's a show title. Mm-hmm. Well, have fun with that. Good luck. That's why we are recording early because you work while I'm not at work, and then I work while you're not at work. This is not going to work very well. It's a mess. Mm-hmm. Lucky for us, we worked together yesterday, and you remembered this when we started talking about the show. We are... I have the notes. We're going to talk about what happened yesterday with the Nordo. Yes. The tech, the, the, the event. So, Nordo. We say Nordo, no radio. A pilot took off out of a satellite airport, climbed up. I was talking to him fine. What are you looking for? You, you being attacked? We just got a lightning strike very close. Uh-oh. Mm, that's not good. Uh. Aircraft seemed fine. And then when I went to issue traffic, crickets. Couldn't get them. Mm. So I went through the whole thing. We've talked about this before. I tried another pilot to relay because sometimes we have reception issues. Although he was high and within 30 miles of the field. So I should have been able to hear him. Yeah. Uh, The pilot couldn't get him. I tried on guard. Didn't work. I tried. I don't know. I didn't. I wasn't that busy at the time. I tried a few times. Probably too many times. It was a lost cause. And then out of nowhere, the pilot checked back in. I said, hey, welcome back. I've been Uh, looking for you. Where you been? (laughs) He said, yeah, I just got a text message from the FAA. Said you were looking for me. I've been here the whole time. I said, I didn't send you a text message. <laughs> he said, it's it's from the FAA. It says you guys were looking for me. Now, what had happened in the meantime, we have a reporting protocol that we go through. And the supervisor had told the powers that be, when we have a uh, radio loss, loss of radio Norda, we have to report that. Somebody gets to deem whether or not it's suspicious. You know, we, we want to be talking to all of our IFR planes. Right. 
And uh, they must have done it because we did not do it locally. But I thought that was a cool story. It's, yeah. And at 8,000 feet in the middle of nowhere. 8,000. 8,000 feet, not near a downtown area where I would think that I would have poor cell coverage on the ground, let alone in the air. Yeah. It didn't used to be that way. We talked about this. It used to be mm-hmm. once you got above, I don't know, 2,000? four. Yeah. At three? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't remember. I mean, we flew around at four and five and six a lot and never got anything. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so... I don't know if they're changing, if the antenna is the way, you know, they do those, or if the antennas have just changed. Maybe there's somebody out there that is smart on that. Um, but I feel like it, like 8,000 feet 10 years ago would be completely unheard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't even have thought at all that my phone would work. So Right. It's funny because we just talked about this last week on an episode. It was a show topic about communication with a pilot. And maybe illegal, maybe not, maybe nobody cares, but it was accidentally left on, perhaps, and voila, it worked. So, maybe we should have a new practice of people leaving their phone on. It'll probably drain your battery, because it'll try to find yeah. coverage. So, maybe if, if you don't have a brick to hook it up to, some sort of battery backup. But, anyway, uh, the day you and I worked together, we had a couple people that knew the show go in and out of the airspace. I tried to play confused and this is an RH. (laughs) And then someone said, you're not fooling anybody, AG. And I, and I laughed and you laughed and everybody (laughs) laughed. (laughs) And then I told them I was AG. So. Which, uh, (laughs) (laughs) which we have a confession. We've been tricking you guys all this whole time. I am actually RH. This voice that you're hearing now <laughs> is RH, and that's AG. So the pilot actually had it right. Without actually having sound effects and nice microphones, because our microphones are meant for getting our voice out, but they're certainly not awesome audio right? in in ATC world. So we do sound a little bit different. When someone sends us tapes, we don't sound the same. No. That, that we do on the show. So I can see why people will get it switched. But yes, I'm Alpha Golf. The other guy is RH. And <laughs> good luck keeping this sorted out. <laughs> the patrons can see our faces. So they know we're not, they know who's who. But right. Right. And the mannerisms and everything. So anything to add before we begin? Um, uh, no, I, I guess not. You're, uh, you don't want to talk last, about your bathroom. <laughs> the last little project. <laughs> the bathroom project has been on hold. I have no more excuses. Tomorrow, after the midnight shift that I do tonight, yes, I'm working tonight, I will wake up and, and do more bathroom. More bathroom project. Okay. So, if you had that on your bingo boards, there you go. There you go. You got another one. Let us begin. All right. Ready. Since OB226, we have several new patrons. Charlie Mike and Sierra Lima are new in the show supporter. I'm sorry, the show listener tier. And we have two Supreme Galactic Aviation Commanders, Golf Whiskey and Echo Golf. I think Golf Whiskey is with us in the chat room today. Welcome. Mike November tripled their per show pledge to move up to the show supporter tier. And interesting, we've never mentioned this. Every month we see some former patrons come back to Patreon, and we want to extend a thank you to them as well. Sometimes supporters don't realize that their credit card used on Patreon expires, or they need to take a break from supporting the show. So when they do come back, we are very appreciative. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome to the new patrons. we got another giant monthly donation via PayPal from Golf Mike. Awesome. And if you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposingbases. And if you haven't done so already, take the two seconds to hit subscribe or follow, depending on which player you're using. So our episodes are downloaded each week and ready to play the next time you're near your podcast player slash car. And if you have time, leave us a five-star review and write a review. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Boop, 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 boop. Just announcements today. Just announcements. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, there are two. Right. Uh, number one. Mm-hmm. SCAC patron Charlie Oscar sent a note about the phone book he just received. <laughs> Look at what was in my mailbox today. Note the saying near the top, the original search engine. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was. Yes, it was. But think about how much that wouldn't make sense mm. if that was printed on there before the yeah. internet. <laughs> yeah, it was a search engine. It's a search book, <laughs> dummy. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. That's two people who've sent us pictures of the phone books they got. I'm telling you, the texting pilots in the air, we just talked about that. We've literally just talked about phone books. Somebody's messing with us, man. Like you know. Yeah. <laughs> The internet, though, is not all it's cracked up to be sometimes, because if you <laughs> you go and try and search for, I don't know, have somebody bring you a load of gravel and try mm-hmm. to find that company on the internet. And sometimes... Difficult. It is difficult. The number's mm-hmm. wrong. You know, mm-hmm. it's outdated. But those people are still putting their business in the phone book. It's still there. I have a yellow pages here in the house mm-hmm. for that for that reason. They work. They're amazing. They do. It is amazing. Only the best businesses. Triple A, one, two, three. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. New patron Mike Golf is instrument rated. Congratulations. He sent a message. You emailed me the answer when you had it from the Terp Self. This was a couple weeks ago. But when I listened to the answer on the show today, I laughed because I was listening as an instrument rated pilot. By the way, the DPE, designated pilot examiner, said I knew a bunch of obscure stuff and had a much deeper knowledge, deeper level of knowledge on procedures, which I credit to both of you and the Terps Elf. My instrument instructor has started telling his students that the first step in getting an instrument rating is to subscribe to opposing bases. Hmm. No word on whether he re- also requires five star ratings. We do though. Yes, we do. So that is a requirement uh, <laughs> for listening. So, congratulations! And in the chat room is another DP. If anybody has any DP questions, RLH is in the chat room. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's been a few weeks, <laughs> but we have a Charlie Alpha segment today. <laughs> Are you ready? I think so. I am looking forward to this. We had a little chit chat. We did a little pre-planning on this so that we could gather our thoughts. Okay. Remember, we always start this off with close your eyes and imagine this. All right. Okay. I'm going to ask you to do something that I did not prepare you for. So you're going to have to dig deep in the memory. Okay. You are 16 years old. This is pre-internet, right? Uh, Yeah. Well, okay. Pre-useful internet. Yeah, pre-getting anything (laughs) productive off of it. (laughs) Right. Okay. You probably didn't have a GPS uh, receiver in your house that people had in their cars. You know, the plug-in. No, No, that that didn't exist. None of that. All right. So a friend needs to come by and pick something up or pick you up, and you have to give them directions to your house. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But they are relying on your knowledge of these directions because that's the only way they're going to know how to get there. Yes. So he is downtown. Give me directions to your house. Oh, man. (laughs) He's Uh, on Main Street. (laughs) So from the interstate. That is usually how these directions had to start. From the big roads, the highways. You could get there. Okay. Okay. Go on 90. Get on I-90. Go eastbound. Then you had to know exits. Right, but back then they weren't all numbered. Numbered. They weren't yeah. back then, right? Oh, no. Well, maybe. Uh, that didn't start where I grew up for a long time. Right, so you... Really? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like... Well, anyway, you had to know the exit. Either the name, it was the road. Okay. okay. It was usually the road or the number. I feel like the numbers were there, but... Okay. I'm on we the were, interstate. I'm heading we were east. way ahead. Now what do I do? 
<laughs> what exit do I get off? Of? I don't know. Uh, t- <laughs> I'll make one up. Three seventy-five. <laughs> okay, three seventy-five. Do I take a right or a left at the light? You go northbound. <laughs> okay, I know my north and south. You have to. <laughs> you do. <laughs> go north. Yes. All right. I'm heading north. Now what? All right. So that would be. Let's see. If you were eastbound and you turned <laughs> north, that'd be like a left. And it's not yeah. a clover, so. It's just a regular kind. Okay. I'm going back over the highway. Yeah, back over the highway. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. How close am I to your house? Minutes? Hours? Uh, now you're probably 10, uh, maybe 12 minutes. How many more turns? Because I can only remember a few two, more. Two more turns. Okay. I'm northbound. Look, I I don't think I've ever discussed this, but <laughs> a lot of places, especially west of the Mississippi River, okay. they based everything on a square, mm, just square true. roads, mm. right? It's very mm. simple. Where I grew up, they even they made it even simpler <laughs> by naming the roads one, two, three, four, five, and north was north of the interstate, and south was south of the interstate, so the interstate started at zero, and then the road just went one, two, three, four, five, south okay. and north, and then from a dividing line road... They went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, going in one way, and then going in the other way, east and west. So you, it was a simple grid you knew, and they were all okay. mile, one mile grids. And any road in between that happened to fall in between two paved, one mile apart roads uh-huh. was a point. So if your driveway was 0.3 miles west of road H... You lived on H.3. Hmm. Right? Okay. So you could know, you could, you would just know where someone lived. Based on their address. On their address. Super easy. If you knew the system. Now, now this person picking you up should understand this grid. And you could have just given me your address. Hey, start here. Proceed north. You're close. Okay. Okay. So... If you haven't picked up on this yet, you're, the driver now has to remember this. <laughs> yes. Or write it down. Maybe you, you're, you're writing it down. Right. You might have a piece of paper with some basic notes on it. 375 northbound, H.3. All right. I got it. I know which way H is when I go north. I got it. I figured it out. And I'll be there. I will get there. Because as the driver, you, you just gave me directions. I have to pay attention. <laughs> There's nothing in the car that's going to tell me when to do something, turn, slow down, I have to pay attention. Right. Okay. Also, <laughs> if you take a wrong turn and you become lost, you can't, you can't call anyone. No, there were no cell phones. There's no phone. And trust me, where, where I grew up, there was not a pay phone. You had to drive all the way back to town if you could figure out how to get there. Okay. You want to talk about this one you mentioned last night. I forgot all about this. Number two, what were long trip options? You want to go somewhere that's not ha- that doesn't have a grid. Okay, no grid. It's far away. It's three hours in the car. It's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> you had... <laughs> I've, I only used this once, and it was... Um, someone else did it. The person I was traveling with. Okay. This was from AAA. Okay. You would go to AAA ahead of time. It had to be ahead of time. You cannot yeah. go... <laughs> At the time of the trip. <laughs> now, this had this to be involved. a planned <laughs> trip. <laughs> it was called Trip Ticks. It was like a strip map, and it uh, it printed out all your directions and your turns, and it was probably, what, an eight and a half by four, maybe? Yeah, you know, I used pe- it one time, too. I, I drove across the country. Yeah, and you flip them, and mm-hmm. as you're going, you flip the page, and it, it goes on to the next chunk of road. Yeah. And it's telling you where all your turns are. And it told you how many miles. So you had to pay attention to your odometer. If you don't know what an odometer is in your car, it's a little, little tracker of how many miles you're going. And yes, you had that, to know where yeah, you started. number below your speedometer that just keeps getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. You can either do math or you could go to, the, you could reset it. The, you know, the one that can be reset, not the one that tracks your entire car mileage yeah, you but can't reset that the, tri- one. that the trip one you could reset so all right i made the turn it says go 50 miles boop start over that was yep pretty basic but that's how you had to do it it is yeah 
Uh, I used one of those going on a long trip. Uh, and here's here's what I was used to as a kid. And I think you said you and I used to use this the same way. We had local directions printed in an atlas. And it was a paper map. The nicer ones had steno. You know, you could unfold the page mm-hmm. and, and not have to fold it like an old sectional chart for airplanes. But you could follow along. And you say, oh, your friend lives in this city. All right, first got to find the city on the map which there was an index in the back that said which grid that city was in. And then you had to basically map out your route there. You chose the biggest roads possible to go the fastest. They were labeled accordingly. And then you had to basically pick an exit. And there were little red, I think they were red, mileage numbers between points. So you had yes. a general idea of scale. Yeah. But you had to have a basic understanding of how maps work. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you had to know... It didn't tell you which way to turn. You had to figure it out. You know, I want to go north. You have a pretty good sense of direction. If you got wrapped around, you know, a highway and exit and got turned around, you had to realize that aiming towards the sun in the evening, you were going (laughs) westbound. (laughs) I I had one of those in my car. That's how I navigated. Oh, yeah. Oh, I couldn't have got around. And um, you could get a super detailed one, like a lot of realtors had used to have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but it gets down to Mm. the street level, residential streets printed on, you know, the map. So you can get, you could get ones that would take you all the way. Those are still up at uh, like the pizza place by us still has that up. So they have grids to tell the drivers whether or not they can go there or not. They look up your address when you call. Yeah. If you're outside the grid, they're not coming, but that was kind of before, all the fancy Uber Eats and yeah. So I delivered time. pizza during this time period. I was 16. Okay. There was no GPS. Okay. Now we weren't in a huge town, but <laughs> you could, you know, I get, I did get lost. Like trying to find some of these places where it was difficult, but we had a huge map, huge. I mean, and it was, yeah, very detailed. So, All right. You want to hit the last one? <laughs> <clears throat> the if last had one. No, if you had no maps, you have no atlas, you have no AAA triptychs, and nobody gave you directions, but you, you just needed to go places, what, what would you do? Uh, you had to pay attention. You <laughs> Listen, I tell my kids now, are you paying attention to where we're going? <laughs> so in three years, when you can drive a car, are you going to be able to get to school? T- could you get yourself there? <laughs> No. Not a chance. <laughs> Sometimes I will, on the way home, I will say, okay, you have the directions. You tell me where to go. If you tell me a wrong turn, I will turn that way. We will, will become require you completely to get completely lost. <laughs> Does it work? Uh, between the two of them, they usually get it figured out. Yeah. I tried that. It's funny. I tried that with my son, and it wasn't recently. He's maybe, he's almost the same age as one of your daughters. He's in the middle. Yeah. He gave me two turns and then gave up. (laughs) He said, I don't know what else to do. I said, well, (laughs) you have to keep paying attention, which is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) right. keep looking out the windows. Right. You never know, because you never know when a turn's coming up. You can't just la-la land, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go go north on this road and turn left on, you know, Mountain Road. Well, Mountain Road, you said to look at every street sign. Yeah. You, <laughs> That's yes. not Mountain no, Road. Yes. Continue. <laughs> this now, is also <laughs> not Mountain Road. <laughs> Where my wife is from, they didn't use roads. They used the landmarks. Turn left at the big white, you know, church. And then at go down two blocks and turn right. There's a huge <laughs> oak tree. You know, and I'm like, What? The oak tree. <laughs> the oak tree. What? <laughs> Landmarks. Oh, we haven't done one of these in a while. That was fun. That was fun. For those of you who've never navigated without the aid of a telephone or smart device in your car, try it one time. Just turn it off. See if oh. you can get somewhere new. We didn't talk about the uh, the other option. Mm. The gas station stop. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> If you were willing to humble yourself far enough, low enough to stop at a gas station and ask an attendant, how, how do I get to the kingdom? How do I get this giant cement building? 
<laughs> and they would typically give you directions back to a very big main road where you get your bearings. Yes. Yeah, you were lost in, you know, third level deep off of, you, there's no lights. Somewhere, you're farther away than you should be, and you can't figure out which way to go. Yeah. Yeah, but that was, you were admitting defeat at that point. If you stopped a car and actually went and asked the stranger how to get somewhere, which was normal back then, they didn't look at you funny. No. They probably had it happen once an hour. Yes. Hey, how do I get to this place? Yeah, Because we didn't have any other help. So we rely on local knowledge to get us to that new place. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for remembering that. Mm. All right, that was it. All right. Shall we, shall we move on? Yeah, very good. Timely feedback. Timely feedback. All right, I'm going to get one or two. You pick. There's only two, but they're go. both pretty long. Well. All right, number one from... SCAC patron Sierra Bravo, hey RH and AG. Today I was flying from the famous Civil War battle under the giant consolidated capital of the free world Bravo to the pork producer town southeast of the mythical triad. I considered the promises for cookies for cancellations with the field in sight. I canceled IFR and the capital city controller thanked me. I just I just knew there will be there would be cookies waiting for me we talked about this several episodes ago cookies for cancellations is a joke about us giving you small treats and awards for canceling airborne (laughs) and making our job easier if you see the field and can proceed vfr anyway i trod through the fbo only to find a forgotten popcorn machine (laughs) languishing from those heady days before the pandemic when pilots would thrust their 100 low lead covered hands into the fracas did i say that right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ensuring the poisoning of all of those to come after them who were merely seeking a savory treat. But I digress. Was it a lie? Are cookies for cancellations as mythical as the very triad itself? I had an un- uneventful but reflective flight back home and decided to console myself with an original chicken sandwich from Burger King just outside the airport. Man. <laughs> wow. Is that really the original chicken sandwich? <laughs> I ordered said sandwich, a cup of water, too dejected to even order fries. I paid the friendly clerk at the first drive through window, and as I collected my bounty from the second window, I was presented with, and this is no lie, two fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> it actually took a minute for it to sink in, but as the prophecy foretold, I had very real cookies for cancellations. I will never doubt you again. Very truly <laughs> yours. <laughs> Sierra Bravo. <laughs> what a what an amazing story. It, it shouldn't is. be a surprise, but you know <laughs> it is a little. I love that story. Thank you for taking the time to write it. And results may vary, but we still encourage cancellations in the air and promise cookies for cancellations regardless of our ability to back that up with real facts. <laughs> results may vary <laughs> yes oh you want number two? Oh wow number two is kind of long i didn't I get, see that i uh, gave you okay. a choice <laughs> fine number two <laughs> from the terp self hello ob i heard you summon me on ob224 regarding your campaign to publish separate higher night minimums on procedures that would otherwise be labeled procedure na at night I only know of one airport that has anything close to what you're thinking about. Uh, Juneau, Alaska. That's Papa Alpha Juliet November. Do you think the controllers in Alaska say, say no to P? Don't, we don't want the P. Like, <laughs> we, don't, like we don't want the K. <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at the LDA uh, X-ray runway eight, it has the following note circling cat a night visibility minima uh, minimum five statute miles circling cat b c d night visibility minimum 10 miles Mm. this is extra unusual and hard to understand because circling to the only other runway runway 26 is na at night anyway but straight into runway 8 also has a night restriction requiring the vgsi to be operational so if you add all those up if it's night and the VGSI is inoperative, 
then you can only fly the circling minimums and only to runway eight, <laughs> but, but with increased visibility. <laughs> weird, huh? <laughs> but <laughs> it's so weird. I can't even wrap my mind around what is happening right now. But Alaska <laughs> is a weird place. And if you're familiar with the terrain around Juno, it's very mountainous in the valleys. Uh, and the valley narrows as you get closer to the runway on the approach. That's a pretty special circumstance and undoubtedly required special scrutiny and approval, perhaps even waiver action to publish. Mm. The issue is that the criteria does not include any different calculation methods for day versus night. As I've discussed in previous responses, there is a 20 to 1 approach plane uh, that extends from the runway towards the final approach fix. If this surface is penetrated by an obstacle and if the obstacle is unlit the procedure is in a at night it's pretty cut and dry there is no provision for increased uh, da mda or visibility in this situation perhaps it has never been fully formally proposed i don't know but it's like increased visibility but it's not like increased visibility would help you see an unlit obstacle anyway no it would not but an increased mda would help would prevent you from flying into it in theory. Uh, So Mm -hmm. could we just raise the minimums at night to above VFR, say, for example, 1,003? Understand that many approaches already have minimums that high for IFR. So that would be an interesting situation. It is my opinion that the main difference between IFR and VFR is that IFR, you are trusting the procedure to keep you safe. If you fly the courses and altitudes and obey the notes, you will be safe. You don't need to have any local knowledge of terrain or obstacles. However, if you're VFR, you can largely do whatever you want. And if you run into a tree on final at night, it's probably largely your own fault. (laughs) Yes. But I do think your campaign to publish higher night minimums or at least allow aircraft to fly the approach to VFR conditions and then land under VFR is interesting. This would be a great topic for someone to bring up to the Aeronautical Chart Meeting Instrument Procedures Group, which is a public meeting the FAA holds twice a year to discuss issues like this. Many changes have been made due to public input at these meetings. Really? Mm -hmm. I've attached an informational link below for any listeners who are interested. Well, I am interested. I am too. There's somebody who's listening to somebody's idea, which is what we were talking about. This is what this is referenced to. Instead of saying not authorized at night because of an unlit tower that's below or I'm sorry, below the MDA and penetrating that 20 to one slope, instead of saying, nope, you can't do this approach at night, which may be the only approach available. I want somebody to get me down to where I can maintain VFR, like he suggested, and continue that way. And then I'm even if there was an unlit obstacle out there that I may not have even known about, even if I was IFR because I can't plot all of the unlit towers in the NAS. It takes forever. And they really haven't come up with an awesome way for us to see that. Maybe they have in helicopter world. I know we've touched on that a little bit, but if you said, hey, here's some higher minimums at night, you can do this approach. But once you descend below the MDA, use caution. This would have been NA at night. You need to be able to proceed VFR and and obstruction clearance is up to you. We need to present that. One of us needs to be there or Charlie Mike from Alaska to present this idea. (laughs) There is a link in the show notes to the meeting. I did not look to see what the date was. I should do that. But perhaps there's a virtual way to attend too, so you don't have to be physically present. But thank you for the link and the explanation. Yeah. That's cool. We're making changes in the NAS, my friend. Real changes. All right. Number three from Mike Kilo Audio. AG and RH. This is Dispatcher Mike from the Flying Life Podcast. Just finished listening to your last episode and the disclaimer and warning of not flying over a class Bravo airspace at 500 feet (laughs) brought back a memory of mine from when I was a young, dumb pilot uh, who just had a private pilot certificate and was, I don't even think I was 21 yet. So young and dumb. Let's just, let's just go with that. I was flying with a friend out of our flight school. And we were just going up flying, have a good time. And we were flying uh, 500 feet uh, above the Windy City Bravo 
and we decided to take a tour of the Windy City city area, well, 10,500 feet, you know, 500 feet above the uh, Windy City Bravo. And we did a couple of laps around uh, Wrigley, uh, flew down the skyline and the lakeshore. And then on the way back, I had the bright idea of, hey, we're up here and well, it seems that these big jets keep getting in our way. So let's get flight following. That's that's probably a better, safer idea. We should probably talk to the controller who's pointing, uh, well, big jets at us. <laughs> so we checked on, we get tagged up with that controller. And uh, <laughs> I believe his transmission to us went something like this. In the interest of aviation safety, Turn right heading 270, cleared through the class Bravo, descend and maintain 4,500 feet. <laughs> yeah, listening to this story and having a few more years uh, underneath my belt uh, made me now realize why <laughs> flying at 500 feet above the Windy City Bravo probably wasn't the best idea in the world. Was it legal? Yes. Was it safe? Probably not. And uh, I probably made that controller uh, very unhappy. Uh, but hey, <laughs> this is all part of aviation and going through and learning. Uh, as always, I appreciate everything you guys do. Listen to your episodes every week. Uh, never really have the time to send feedback on them, even though I have a feedback to send pretty much every single uh, episode. But uh, keep up the good work. You guys are great. Thank you, Mike Kilo, for sharing your confession. <laughs> it's been a long time since we really addressed that, but be part of the NASA, and now we can top you if you're lower instead of circling above the top of airspace, which, again, you're not doing anything illegal, but the, you're driving the controllers and all the uh, resolution advisory equipped aircraft yes. nuts. <laughs> yes. You're driving them nuts. We have one more audio about the same thing. Oh, right. From In OB220, we talked about scenic flights above Bravo airspace. You included audio from Sierra Lima, please do not fly 500 feet above a Bravo. In that moment, I almost died. In the fall of 1980, I did this all the time as a college sophomore. I took many of my friends on scenic flights above the Beantown TCA, Terminal Control Area, as it was called then. The top of the TCA was 7,000. I would spiral up west of the TCA, overfly at 7,500, heading directly for Beantown, and then reverse all of that on my way back to Lincoln Labs control zone, now called the Delta. These were night flights. Fortunately, even though I was 20 years old, it had occurred to me that Beantown controllers might wonder what in the world I was doing. So I always called them shortly after departure to tell them my plan, and they always approved it. I did it so often they got to know me, and sometimes gave me shortcuts. Anyway, I said I almost died hearing Sierra Lima's audio, but then he added, without talking to anybody. I breathed a sigh of relief because I did communicate. It's good to talk to controllers. For example, you get to witness some very special moments. On one night flight, I was at 7,500 on my return westbound. I saw a ginormous airliner climbing right to left below me and to my left. It was easy to see at night with its big tail illuminated with a floodlight. As I admired it, I heard Beantown Approach transmit, Acme 123 Heavy, will you marry me? Female voice, that's affirmative. Then Approach said to me, nine or five x-ray, traffic 10 o'clock and four miles, climbing through 4.5, that's my fiance. <laughs> to which I answered, tally ho, congratulations. I know in another episode you said Tally Ho was silly. I just want you to know I meant well. <laughs> Thank you, Golf Kilo. That's awesome story. That's I an like awesome Tally story. I, I mean, it is silly, but I still like it. Did we determine where that came from? Is it a ship term? A nautical term? It has to be na some Navy thing. <laughs> <laughs> you very quickly... Some, some Only just... the Navy... They have the weirdest stuff. Oh. All right. The moral of those two stories, don't be afraid to call air traffic. If you think you're out of the way, you're probably in the way. 
even if you're not in the Bravo or in the Charlie, please call us. Public yes. service announcement. Call ATC. Yes. All right. We don't have a show topic today, but I'll play the funny jet noise. Today is going to be all feedback. We have three of them. And the first one is... Oh, this is on the bingo board. Hold on. Let me turn the volume down because I had to turn that up for the audio. Feedback time. Feedback. I'm making my camera mad. It's not liking the refocus. I'll stop moving. Sorry, I just got blurry. That's my fault. All right. The number one feedback is from Patreon Juliet Mike. Send an audio. Hi, Patreon Juliet Mike from the Western Slope Echo. Hey, I've got a question for y'all. We are on the same frequency as about five or six different airports around here in the Western Slope of the Rocky Mountain State. Same CTAF frequency. Um, the Red Rock Airport to the west, Winchester Airport to the north, Steam Train Airport to the south, along with our two airports here in the valley. Um, the one I fly out of, teach out of, is a small one, and then just to the south of us, about 20 miles, is the main airline destination for our big ski resort town to the south of us and also a major diversion point for the rich man <laughs> rocky mountain airport to the east and the uh, airport to the south of us with the uh, ski town so we get calls on ctaf from up to 150 miles there's an airport way to the northwest of us close to the big salt lake area and we even get calls from there with business jets coming in, talking to the FBOs, talking about passengers and whatever. And then the Red Rock Airport to the west, they have a skydiving operation and we hear them announcing their drops from 12 and 14,000 feet about every 15 minutes throughout the entire summer. My point is, is that there's too many people on 122.8 <laughs> And we have an insane amount of traffic, especially in the winter, here in our valley. Is there a way to petition the FAA to change frequencies for a CTAF um, airport? Like, to, to change the frequencies on CTAF. I would like to change just my airport that I teach out of and our, the one just south of us that has tons of airline and business jet traffic along with GA. Because I get really tired of hearing people from 100 to 250 miles away jabbering about food and cars <coughs> and passengers and jumping and all this stuff. And it gets really full on the frequency and you can't even make the calls you need to make because everyone's stepping on everybody across the country. So, anyways, there's my little pet peeve of the day, and I really wish we could change it, but I'm not sure how to go about it. Anyway, thanks for every, everything you do. I really enjoy the show. All right, I did a little homework on this one. Thank you for sending that audio, Juliet Mike. Something is squeaking in your vehicle. Did you identify the squeak? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I did a little homework. I put a link in the show notes. The AOPA magazine did an article on this online about air traffic services process brief changing Unicom frequencies. It is possible. There is a process in place to petition the FAA to get that. And if they do a study on it, which may not take that long for them to realize, or they have somebody that works at the FISDO or the FAA that's experienced that, perhaps it's somebody just asking for the actual change. I will summarize what I learned. This was a bigger problem when there weren't more frequencies allowed to be used for Unicom slash CTAF. There have been new frequencies added that are available. And for those of you who don't understand what we're talking about, radio frequencies, there's only a, a, there's a finite amount and they share them uh, for non-towered airports. It's not uncommon. 22.8 is probably 30% of the airports in the NAS. 
uh, that are non-towered, and you will hear other traffic at other airports. It's super frustrating if either one is busy, and not everybody can hear everything, depending on the receiver in their airplane, the strength of the transmission from the airplane that it's coming from. And if you're trying to make timely, safe traffic calls, and you can't get in because as soon as you key up, you're blocking somebody else. Now everybody hears just a, like a hissing, blocking noise. It's very distracting. So it's, it's not because you're being unreasonable. It is annoying and annoying to the point of being unsafe if you can't make broadcasts. So check out the link in the show notes. I did send this back to Juliet Mike and keep us posted if that works. Maybe it will take long. I don't know. It's the FAA. It may not be quick, but right. there is a process in place. That's Anything good. To add to that? That's you, good. You've experienced busy CTAFs, right? Yeah, oh, yes. Yes. No, it's no good. <laughs> How does it make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell those other people to get out of my ear. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah, the, just the short flight that I did last week. Uh, that CTAF is shared by a few airports, and you have to pay attention to the entire call because they're making the standard downwind base final crosswind calls. And if all that's if that's all you heard was the aircraft type and the and the leg of the pattern they're in, you will be looking for airplanes at your field. But you have to listen to the entire call and realize it's somewhere else. Yes, yes. That is why it is important for you to say the airport <laughs> yes. at the beginning and the end of each transmission. Mm-hmm. Yes. Pet That's peeve why. Of that is why. This whole scenario is why you must say that. It's not just something someone made up. Nope. There's good news. There is a solution to this. Perhaps you guys can divide this up with frequencies. As soon as you get far enough out of range where you're not picking up the whole world on that frequency... It should help a ton. So good luck. Let us know how it goes. Yes. You want number two? Number two. From patron Golf Kilo, late at night, years ago, I landed at Electric City for a fuel stop. I was IFR coming from the east. And as far as I could tell, I was the only traffic. Approach cleared me for the visual. Tower cleared me to land on runway four. He didn't say how. Uh... With the back wheels first, the fifth, <laughs> <laughs> the field <laughs> main gear first, nose gear second. The field sits on a plateau on the east side of the field uh, is a ridge. Southwest of the field are tall towers. West of the field is a valley and fewer terrain concerns. I overflew the field on a crosswind. <laughs> Oh, boy. To enter a midfield left downwind. <laughs> oh, boy. That's right. <laughs> over flew the field on a crosswind to enter a midfield left downwind over the valley. As I was turning downwind, the tower asked me what I thought I was doing. <laughs> I, it not what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? <laughs> it's a big distinction <laughs> between those two questions. I said I was turning downwind. Tower said I wasn't supposed to cross the center line of of runway four. I was puzzled. Yes, I crossed the center line, but I was overhead. He seemed annoyed at me, but that was all. At a social gathering at my home airport, Little League, I asked our local friendly class Delta controller if he thought I'd done anything wrong. He didn't think so. What do you think? Um, <laughs> yes. If I had a plane that I that was cleared for the visual and cleared to land and they passed over the airport, it would be weird. I would probably ask the same thing. What, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, say intentions. What is it that you're planning on doing here? Right. Because typically you would stay on that side of the airport. Mm -hmm. to join final somewhere on the arrival side. <clears throat> My search was very short, but the references to the visual approach and all the documents you can find, I won't bother reading them all on the show. It, there is nothing that explicitly says what flight path you must or cannot fly. It's not that specific. Right. Clear of clouds, land as soon as possible, 
And but there's there are certain underlying expectations, historical references. Like everyone has done this exact same thing, and now here comes <laughs> your airplane. Now I get why you did it. It's a good explanation. You know, there's less obstacles. There's no terrain to fight with. Oh yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, <clears throat> I, and and strictly speaking, by looking in a book for a reg that says you can't do what you did, I. I don't know, and I don't know what they were referring to in the tower when they said you weren't supposed to cross the center line. Uh, if we're talking about parallel airports, that's an expectation when you get a visual to a parallel runway. But this specific scenario, I don't believe, is spelled out as they do not do this. Uh, no, I haven't read that <laughs> anywhere. Anyway. But the tower should have said something before reaching even anywhere near the field. If you yeah. hadn't started at what appeared to be a downwind or... A base, something that appeared to be normal for what they expected. I say normal, but um, and what you did isn't abnormal. It's at a non-towered airport or at a towered airport, it would be very strange. And here, that would lead to a loss of separation. We're launching departures. Yeah, we're assuming that no one's going to overfly the field. Right. Yeah. Before you got to the field, <laughs> once you were pointed at the field, and you weren't turning. And you were staying high, I would have said, uh, do you have the airport in sight? Mm-hmm. You know, are you okay? Is everything okay? Could I point to a regulation that says you're doing the wrong thing? I guess not. Could I point to precedence? <laughs> yes. And I don't I I don't think you'd find a controller that wouldn't be somewhat confused. Baffled. Yeah. What is <laughs> happening? Now, if you explained prior, hey, could I do this, fly overfly the field for a left downwind for the terrain or towers or whatever, fine. Yep, all day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, announce actions. I would have liked to head up, heads up instead of a, well, we're turning downwind, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, at a non-towered airport, it <clears throat> that is one of the ways you can enter. You can you know, cross over field and put yourself on a downwind. That's a normal maneuver, but when you're talking to a controller and they're used to seeing airplanes turn and do everything on the side of the airport that you reported in on, just keep that in mind. Yeah. And and I've I've never had anybody even come close to asking that. We don't face the terrain issues that you're talking about. Uh, but if you feel like you're inclined to do that again or do something that isn't starting on that side and doing a couple more turns on that side of the field, I'm trying to explain that without getting too confusing then you should probably key up and say, hey, this is what I need to do. I'm high, or I don't want to hit this tower. Can I do it on the other side of the airport? And I agree with you. I, if there was no traffic, especially, sure. Yeah. Proved as requested. Clear to land. Yeah. I've had planes, though, where they're clear for the visual, they're straight in, and they don't descend. They're not descending. And it becomes really, at a point, it it becomes really obvious, like, you're in a weird place. <laughs> what are your plans from here? Yeah, what? Are you okay? Uh, no, we lost this. We lost sight of the field. That was, I've had that a couple of times. No, nope, we don't see the field. Okay. Well, good that you didn't keep descending into mm-hmm. who knows where if you didn't mm-hmm. see the field. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, we'll usually throw out a question like, hey, are you still going to be able to make it down from there? That's the pilot's turn to kind of take inventory of their <laughs> situation. Why are they asking me that? Yeah. Wait a second. I'm a mile from the field. I'm at a thousand feet. The space yeah. shuttle wouldn't be able you're, to do this. You're in a weird place. <laughs> Controllers are not trying to fly your airplane for you. Okay. They're not in the cockpit, but what they do know is that thousands and thousands of the other planes that they've worked aren't in the place that you are in. You're yeah. in a weird place. <laughs> we know, we know. Hey, at 30 miles out and you're at 12,000 feet, hey, you're a couple thousand high. You're in a mm-hmm. weird place. You need to get down. I know you need to get down because every other plane before you that didn't go around <laughs> for an <laughs> unstable approach <laughs> was much lower than you are now. So, Sort of tangentially related. Did you like that word? I did. I like that a lot. I had an airplane going to a non-towered airport today. This isn't about a visual. They needed an approach. But to center, in their infinite wisdom, decided to dump them into my possession yeah. at 22,000 feet, 30 miles from this non-towered airport, which I'm sure they didn't know where it was. 
Not the pilots. The pilots knew. The, oh, the pilots know where the, where they were. <laughs> but the controllers that were, they crossed the center boundary line, yep. pointed it out to the east center, dumped them on me. Well, I had opposite direction inbound arrivals that were much lower, 10,000 feet below them, but I had to get him beneath them, and he was super high. So I ended up having to ask for help because I needed to have a conversation with the center to get control. We don't typically need control high. We can wait till they get in our airspace. But if I waited till he got to 12, he was going to be at the field. And he was not in a hurry to descend. Yeah. I said, please get on the phone. I need a right turn, an almost a 180 degree turn to basically make a downwind. And everybody was in a weird spot. If I walked in the room <laughs> and saw what was happening, I'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Who created this mess? And I was just trying to clean it up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it felt weird. And this kind of relates to what you were saying about we can see weird things. We know what's not normal. Yeah. An aircraft at 15,000 feet turning away from the airport that they were landing, aimed at center's airspace, still not in my airspace. Right. It felt weird. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. I asked the pilot that one time. It was an Embraer airline uh, pilot. And I said... They were in a very weird spot. The center gave them to me in a place I have never taken a handoff <laughs> on an airliner before. And I said, how? after they checked in, yeah, runway two through left, blah, blah, blah. And I said, how, how did you get where you are now? <laughs> he said, I'm not really sure what you're asking. <laughs> Just explain to me the events that transpired prior to <laughs> you being in the place that you're in. <laughs> <laughs> okay our moral of that story golf kilo is key up and let them know you want to do that it is not normal to go across at a towered airport so yeah key up and explain that beforehand all right we only have one more we're doing very good on time and this one's mm -hmm. mine yeah hmm? yeah all right number three from mike kilo you could start looking at these pictures that i attached below Oh, yeah. Side note, that picture is one picture. You cannot manipulate that. It was 20 megabytes, those two screenshots. So I had to do another screen grab. Jeez. It wouldn't let me send you the notes. <laughs> From a 90-inch <laughs> I don't know why screen? it's so yeah, big, but huge. now that's much smaller. It's 20K, I think, now. All right, All right Mike Kilo from the Banana Peel Charlie. I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <Don't either>. <laughs> <laughs> Just east of the Big Apple Bravo with a question about forced cancellation of IFR. I was flying home from the lack of electricity Delta, just southwest of the Billy Joel Charlie, last week, and I heard an interesting exchange <laughs> between an IFR aircraft on a VMC day trying to fly an approach into the unfortunately located uncontrolled field just under the Bravo arrivals and departures, pictures included in our notes, uh, <clears throat> they were using the circling GPS approach. It's the only approach to that airport, by the way. And the controller asked if the pilots were familiar with the cancellation procedures into that airport. They said they were not and were sternly lectured that they should have been, they should have known this before they showed up at a busy place like this. <clears throat> by the way, I did this on homework too. There's nothing online that talks about this outside of chat rooms, which no pilot is going to go just searching through random chat rooms. Yeah. to find this local knowledge out. But <laughs> leave it to controllers anywhere to think the world revolves around their airspace <laughs> and that everybody <laughs> should just know. All right, sorry, sidebar. <laughs> uh, they sh she said they can't stop arrivals and departures for them at this busy airport. And that's next to it. They're Lay out the scene here. They're under and very close to finals at a very busy Bravo, okay? They can't stop the arrivals and departures for them. And they need to cancel IFR by three miles from the field or they need to go around. During the approach, she continued to ask if they had the airport in sight. And eventually they said they did. Her response was, and? <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for them to finally say they would like to cancel IFR. At which point everyone cordially said their goodbyes. After landing, I needed to know if this information was codified anywhere. Of course, it is not. And I scoured the AFD instrument procedures, etc., for additional information with nothing to be found. So it seems like the controller expected a transient pilot to have local knowledge of something they usually do, but it feels like an unrealistic expectation that could have been handled a bit differently. 
Additionally, can a controller refuse to allow an aircraft to fly an approach on an IFR flight plan to a completion like this? I'll stop right there and answer that question. Can they refuse to allow it? On a, on a VMC day, you're going to have a lot of uh, justification to make that you need that approach. They want you to do the visual and, and cancel. This airport has, I'm going to pause and actually defend the procedure. It's designed really, I think, smart for the position it's in. The missed approach point is just shy of four miles away from the center lines at the big Bravo. Can you see that picture where I put the little yeah, yeah. measuring stick there? It's like three and a half miles from final. Right. So they're basically paralleling underneath the finals to the big bad Bravo. And if you get to this point where you need to make a right turn to go get closer to those finals, you basically need to go missed if you're if you're not VFR and you're not going to cancel. If the missed approach procedure turns you back to the west, away from the parallel approaches, whoever designed this knew there was a need for IFR approach in there. I think it's really well done. The expectation that you will cancel in the air and kind of sternly lectured is not appropriate, in my opinion. No. Uh, but she could have spent that exact amount of time to lecture you and saying, if you can't cancel by this point because you're not able to see the airport, we need you to turn back to the west, which is designed on the approach plate that she had access to as well. Because if you continue straight ahead IFR, we're going to have a loss of separation because we're blocking that airspace. And now we're, we're merging with this final at the big, bad Bravo. So the procedure is really well done, I think. But I think that time was better spent explaining, all right, if you can't cancel, we're in a bad place. Yeah. I don't, you need to turn west. All right. Additionally, can a controller uh, refuse to allow the aircraft to fly the approach? Yes. I think they could say you're going to have to hold until we're not during an arrival bank. Right. And we've run into that with stories about Metroplex and certain airports that you're going to get way too close to final. And they're not designed like this. They're not designed as uh, thinking ahead and planning for a mist. This one, I think, what do you think of this approach, the way it is, knowing what you know now? Seem like it's a good idea, that approach? Yeah, it's one of those, like he goes on to say, if if the weather is garbage, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm looking for another airport maybe. Yeah, the minimums are pretty high. They're like six or 700 feet above the ground. Additionally, uh, I, I already said that part. I completely, I completely understand the conundrum and can imagine the havoc a pilot could cause by not canceling and forgetting to cancel, I would be concerned that pilots are being pressured to cancel on a marginal day and end up in the clouds with no options at 600 feet and an absolutely terrible position. Anyway, thanks for an amazing podcast. And just curious where in the spectrum of gray this whole situation lies. All right, I'll say it again. The expectation that every pilot is going to know these local isms for a non-towered airport that happens to be poorly positioned, uh, in reference to a Bravo, that's unrealistic. The controllers need to realize that not everybody there is a local itinerant pilot. So, right. um, but if you find yourself planning to go to a field that, you know, do a little bit of homework, you'd see this is the only approach available. And hey, it's this is weird. weird. It is weird. It, instead of going straight the whole time, it gets to the missed approach point, and either you go west to go missed. Or you go east to get closer to the Bravo. It's 45 degrees off the final. Which is extremely unusual. Yes. It so is as a, way as a pilot, off. You would be thinking, why is this designed this way? So the screenshots that we're looking at, I put some traffic for the parallel runway. It, they top you. They are above you on their base turn. And they turn final and they literally parallel that approach. If you make the right turn... You're not paralleling anymore. You're causing a collision. You're converging, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> converging. Bad. Yes. You kind of have to put a few layers together for this to make sense. Um, pilots should realize ahead of time, and the controller should let them know, hey, uh, maybe it's not often that you have an IFR arrival in there. Maybe it's only one or two a day. But if there are arrivals into that airport, they are not going to stop the world for one airplane to go into this. So they... They could tell you there's going to be a delay. I have 100 more arrivals, and that's not exaggerating. They may have 100 more. I need you to hold. Or we can send you to an airport that's a little bit further west, and you can wait until the weather breaks and, and fly over VFR. So I, I, don't, I don't want to say this too meanly, but 
there's no right or underlying rule that would say we have to stop these arrivals into this Bravo to get you in. I don't know that anybody's yeah. going to make that decision. Right. This when is the kind of airport like the one we talked about. <clears throat> oh, I don't remember how many episodes back, but you need to have good weather to go in here. Mm -hmm. Don't plan on going into somewhere like this in marginal. I, you need right. to have a good high ceiling here and have it forecast to be that way well through your period of arrival. Mm -hmm. um, or you are going to find yourself in a weird situation. This could be something that you could suggest to the agency that they put it in the chart supplement, what used to be called the AFD, as a note. Hey, IFR arrival should understand there's only one approach, which you can see when you do your planning, but... If if you plan on if you are unsure of whether or not you're gonna be able to break out and cancel, you're gonna be turned westbound in a mist, and they may not give you a second chance. They're gonna say, say intentions. We're not doing this over and over again. You know, if you went down IFR and could, had to go mist, it's safe. You're away from that arrival. Yeah. That's why I think it was designed very well. Yeah. Oh, it is, yeah. I don't know. I think that was worth talking about for a few minutes. Anything yeah. to add to it? I like how they actually have it ever so slightly maybe a degree of divergence mm -hmm. just a little bit yeah just a tiny little bit it's yes. almost as if they they tried to make it where there was some divergence and they at a point where they said nope they can't be any closer than this so the angle can only be so far somebody in the terps world spent a lot of time making sure that this could work it actually looks like does the course change? It does between... Yeah. Before uh, Datvi, between Ward and Datvi. Yeah, by like four degrees. Four degrees, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's, weird approach. It is it weird. Would, <laughs> but if you find yourself planning ahead to go to this airport and this is your, your destination, it's the only approach which should make you think, all right, this is the only alternative. If you lost GPS, I couldn't fly this approach so what are my backups all right well there's tons of airports in this area that you can go to the bravo might not be the plan we talked about that before but <laughs> there's other yeah. towered airports that you could work into that would probably do just fine yeah it might cost you an extra uber but we used to do an approach into <laughs> uh, fort lee virginia that was similar to this except you got to the missed approach point it was timed so at mm -hmm. a time, you looked 90 degrees left, and you should see a helipad. Not a runway, not some big, giant piece of asphalt, a tiny little helipad in the middle of a base. And if you didn't see it, you were missed approach. On a good day, it was so far away. On a good day, you could not see it. Like, I just don't see it. <laughs> right. We're, we're the, going chat room's, the chat room's trying to figure out what we're talking about. I put it in the notes. Uh, the airport. Uh, if you're new to this show, we try to keep everything anonymous as to not get anybody in trouble for asking very specific local questions. And we're not trying to throw any local controllers under the bus. Perhaps a deep breath before you get mad at this random pilot. Hey, I need you to cancel because if you don't, we're going to have a go around at Big Bad Bravo. So, yeah. all right, I'm on the same page. What you could play that game. Which could have ripple effects of delay. I mean, delays. You could delay a lot of <laughs> all over the place. Yes, the world. <laughs> yes. There's a handful of airports, let's call it 10, in the United States, that if there are big delays, everywhere else in the world is affected. Yeah, it's the butterfly Every effect. Yes. I don't have anything else to add to this one. That's good, because... You have to go. I have to go. All right, check out atcsacks.com to find a great way to keep your ATC headset free from dust and dirt. We have feedback up to March 16th. Just prior to that, 2022, right on the show, or we'll respond via email. If you didn't hear from us, check your spam. And let us know. AG, anything to add before you go? I'll stay around for a little bit. Okay. Uh, nope. All right. Closing out episode 227 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Drop. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases or send feedback directly to their inbox at 
feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.